Welcome to Web3 and Whiskey, a podcast about how the decentralized internet will change our lives. In each episode, we react to a future when users and communities have all of the power and when our digital lives could be as vibrant, more vibrant than our real life. And we drink whiskey while we're doing it. I'm your host, Gary Liu, and as always, I'm joined by Suresh Balaji, founder of the Web3 Marketing Association, and Malcolm Ong, a product leader and serial entrepreneur. And we have our producer, Disco Wolf, with us, or as we call him, D-Dubs. He's here to fact-check us and judge our opinions. If D-Dubs likes what we say, you will hear a... And if he dislikes our opinion, you will hear a... Now, quick disclaimer, we don't show projects on this podcast. That, by the way, is becoming increasingly important that we say that. So <laughs> consider any excitement that you hear from us to be personal opinion. And our opinions should never be taken as investment advice of any kind. All right, we've had a couple of weeks where we were able to be in real life in person with one another. I know that only one of those podcasts has released so far. That was our special edition on FTX, but there, uh, there's at least one more that's coming where we were actually recording in the same place. But now, travel started again. Suresh, you're back on the road. Uh, you know, you got your hair tied up. You're looking super cool today. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing all right. I, I did enjoy the IRL recording. That was good, huh? That was fantastic. I mean, hanging out, the banter was out of control. And uh, before you came one of those days, uh, Disco Wolf took us to a Cha Chan Teng where we went and, I mean, it is supposed to be Whiskey and Web3. We decided that, you know, if we had a parallel one, we would call it Whiskey and Yin Yang. Yeah. Um, you know, for those of our listeners who don't know, you know, Yin Yang, it is a coffee and tea mix, which is a special Hong Kong blend. It is, I mean, lots of whiskey at Whiskey at Web3. And Web3, the next morning, you need a yin yang, uh, which is coffee and, and tea. And to be clear, for a lot of our listeners from, you know, the Western parts of the world, we're not talking about, like, some weak-ass tea. We're talking about, like, Hong Kong, like, tea. It is... Just loads of tea leaves squeezed together in what is effectively a sock and water slowly drained through. I mean, the the caffeine content of that tea is ridiculous. And to mix that then with coffee uh, and then put a little bit of, you know, like uh, like a sweetener in it. Oh, that's the start to the morning. That's for sure. That was my first time having it. Really, Malcolm? You've been in Hong Kong for six plus years, mate. I think because I never would drink the Hong Kong coffee. So I would always opt for the milk tea. Well, you've been introduced to a whole new world, whole new world of uh, of caffeinated life. Uh, and, and Malcolm, I'm glad that you have uh, you have the American flag behind you once again, since we're remote, especially because today is Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Oh, oh my goodness, I should have brought a bourbon. Why did I not think to bring a bourbon today <laughs> for Thanksgiving? Oh, I'm sorry yeah, to true. American listeners. I feel terrible. I feel like a like a a bad American for not drinking bourbon. On Thanksgiving. Um, now, speaking of which, we're going to get to our whiskeys in a second, but our topic for today is a follow on from our special edition about FTX. And the topic for today is what if Binance collapses? Okay, Oof. the big one, the big B, what if Binance collapses? Um, but before we get to that, let's start with our whiskeys, gentlemen. Uh, so, what do we have today? Malcolm, I'm going to start with you. Please tell me you brought a bourbon. I have a wild turkey. Oh, we go. Mm. Oh, right. <laughs> All right. There we go. <laughs> so happy Thanksgiving. How does that taste to you today? It's, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. Going from scotch to wild turkey, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> very different taste. So, okay. Well, you know, it's supposed to burn on Thanksgiving, um, but it is a proper Kentucky straight bourbon. Um, it is not the fanciest of bourbons. Uh, but it gives you the the hometown taste and the hometown burn. Um, Suresh, what about you? Do you drink with Coke, uh, Malcolm? W wild Turkey, is it done with Diet Coke, Coke, or do you go straight? I I mean, I just drink it straight in general. I think, listen, Wild Turkey, there's a range of Wild Turkey. And there's some really nice Wild Turkey you should only ever drink straight. But then there's also the stuff that you can get in like a plastic bottle at a gas station. that's still <laughs> labeled Wild Turkey. <laughs> That you have to cut with some some soda. I'll chase it chase it with my hibiki. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Suresh, I'm, you're in a hotel, so there's again one of three that we can choose from. So yeah, it is one of three. It is Shivas Regal. Uh, so uh, hey, nothing against Shivas Regal. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's an everyday go-to. Never go wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When in doubt, 
remember our FTX uh, special edition, the whiskey that I brought that was very special, was a distiller's edition Strathyla, which is one of the base whiskeys for Chivas Regal, and specifically, it's the main whiskey represented in Chivas Regal 25. I'm not having the 25. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, today, I brought another uh, Flora and Fauna. I've introduced these bottles before. Oh my goodness, the light is so bright. You see how shiny I am too? Um, it's another Flora and Fauna, so you know based on the bottle that this is a, a distillery owned by Diageo and used in their blends. Uh, this is Linkwood. This is the only original bottling Flora and Fauna that they bottle. It's a Linkwood 12. Um, and you can see the color here in my glass and in the bottle is super light. Um, and that's one of the characteristics of a Linkwood is that they don't do much to this. They don't try to age it in any like crazy special cast. It is just a straight Speyside whiskey from this little tiny distillery in a town called Elgin, uh, which is in Speyside. And it is, honestly, it is very strong in taste. But when I say strong in taste, not like peated stuff from Isla, but it is the strong in the Speyside taste, uh, which is you get the moss. You get the moss from the water that comes into Speyside that gets effectively filtered through vegetation to get super, super clean water. Yeah, and you taste that right on the tip of the tongue. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not a very long finish, but it is a very strong finish throughout, uh, strong taste throughout. And I love it. I mean, it's very, again, uh, most people don't know Linkwood, um, but if you can ever find a, a, a bottle of this, I would recommend it. They do awesome things with it when they're, it's bottled in independent bottles because because it's so strong uh, in its sort of original space I taste, they can do some crazy stuff with it, make it super, super sweet using casks, kind of age it in three different casks and have it really uh, you know take on a lot of character. So Linkwood, always fun to have. So gentlemen, happy Thanksgiving. And uh, hey, happy that cheers to another podcast. Cheers, cheers. cheers. Hey Gary, I have a, I have a question for you. You you we we agree not to shill um, projects, but are we allowed to shill whiskey? We're always allowed to shill whiskey. Absolutely, okay. until we invest <laughs> in a tokenized whiskey project, and then we have to start being careful. Oh, fair enough. And and when are we? The second question is when are we doing an IRL special? in isla oh my goodness it's like imagine i'll that. tell you i got a big birthday coming up middle of next year in 2023 and uh it, it has always been my dream to do a big birthday in scotland and i do believe that that suresh you and malcolm both of you guys have long been invited to this birthday and d-dubs as well so uh why don't we aim for that middle of 2023 IRL yeah. at a distillery. D Dubs, you got to get on that. I'll send you some distilleries that we could record at, and uh, we should do a series of Web3 and whiskeys right next to the stills. I yeah. love it. That's it. That'd be yeah. awesome. All right. Uh, <laughs> before we get to the main discussion, let's also get some reactions to the news. A lot has happened. We're going to try and keep this tight so we can get to the Binance discussion. D Dubs, what do you have for us this week? Hey, guys, I have five news items for you this week, as always. First, Nike launches the Dot Swoosh Web3 platform with Polygon NFTs to come in 2023. Suresh. The most successful mainstream brand in Web3 is without doubt Nike, right? Um, this is mostly thanks to their acquisition of RTFKT, right? Or Artifact last year. Um, I, we don't know how much they bought it for, but someone says $100 million. But I think that Nike have generated close to $200 million in revenue from the projects. Uh, from primary and secondary sale, which is great, right? I think I think they have always wanted to move from a product to an experience. And you you remember those bands that they created? I don't know what they were called. Fuel bands. Um, oh so yeah, fuel bands. I owned one of those. Nike, yeah. um, I should have one in the drawer somewhere as well, right? So so all of these Nike's always wanted to stay ahead of the product experience and, and create sort of an experience. I think they see. I think they see Web three as something that is uh, giving them an opportunity to create these experiences. Uh, and this time around, they want services, utilities, all baked in. Uh, Albert, some of that sounds dumb. Some of them sounds really cool, right? I mean, they say they're talking about token gating chats with shoe designers. Do I really want to, you know, ch you know, get an NFT and then get into Discord and have a chat with the shoe designer? When was the last time you wanted to chat with the shoe designer? I don't know about that. But I think when they, the, the part which makes sense for me is they're moving from customers to holders, right? And I think when, when you're, you become a holder, then you, you get, you know, wearability of the NFT. You, then you get to pre-order a physical counterpart. Uh, when you sell the physical counterpart, maybe the NFT goes with it. I think there's a lot going on in this space and them, you know, it's taking 
uh, claim for we are a Web3 native brand is phenomenal. So kudos to them. Yeah, I agree. Kudos to Nike for, you know, continue to innovate and adopt new tech. Uh, first, like you said, it was the NFT studio. They just keep surprising me away, just keep going and going. And it's like, I think it's great for their customers. It's great for their fans. Um, so I think this is pretty cool. I love it. Uh, they are going to contribute a lot to onboarding the next billion people into blockchain, into Web3. Um, you can buy Dot Swish with uh, stuff, uh, um, the memorabilia with credit cards, and it is memorabilia. It's, it's priced significantly lower than our Artifact stuff, supposedly. Artifact, of course, is going to be that Web3 native brand that Suresh talks about, and Dot Swish is uh, all the other virtual, um, uh, virtual assets. What do they call them? Virtual goods or something like that virtual that they're going to sell. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing is, it's not just about onboarding the next billion. It's also about ownership. Um, and we're talking about this is going to be a creator's platform that starts a massive creator economy. So it's not just going to be famous sneaker or uh, uh, you know shoe, shoe designers. But you and I, eventually, anyone, can design paraphernalia and go to that as a marketplace. I'm sure Nike is going to take a little bit of a marketplace rake. But you know what? I'll give it to them as long as it's not like the 30% Apple or like a freaking 65% meta a rake. But if they take a little bit of a rake, they're creating a creator economy for designers that has never existed before. So that I love. That is pure Web3. Well done, Nike. Second, speaking of pure Web3, the Pacific Island nation, Tuvalu, says it'll become the first digital nation on the metaverse. Malcolm. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I think metaverse aside, it's a little bit depressing, you know, uh, because of the climate change and the effects of climate change. This this small island nation is effectively facing this existential crisis. Um, so uh, I don't know. I thought it was a little bit you know, sad to, to read. Um, and, you know, though their land may eventually be lost, I'd, I'd imagine and I hope that they actually are able to preserve their culture and their people, um, you know, perhaps emigrating somewhere else or, 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 or whatnot. So, um, you know, I don't really have a comment on the metaverse side, but I just thought, wow, this really, really highlights, you know, kind of the, the climate change side of things. Yeah, I mean, Tuvalu was, um, and pardon the pun, like put on the map because um, they went to the UN a couple of years ago and gave this impassioned speech about how how the this is an island nation, how the uh, their islands were going to uh, very quickly be underwater and they're going to actually lose their country. Um, and there's a very real potential that they they might be the first country to be wiped off the face of the planet because of rising um, sea levels. Now, I don't know exactly how this Web3 play will work out long term. Can we really create a virtual world where culture can not only exist, but continue to evolve? I, I mean, I, I think generally speaking, yes, yes. But to translate um, a, an ancient, uh, you know, oceanic culture of, of the, the Isles of Tuvalu into, the, into Web3, into the metaverse, um, well, you know, if they're going to try because it's, it's about preservation, Great, obviously, you know, from Artifact Labs standpoint and what we're building right now, Artifact Labs, this makes all the sense in the world. I will say this is going to be a marketing case study. And I'm not I don't mean marketing and like I'm, I'm not just kind of dismissing the importance of what they're doing. But I love the fact that this announcement was done with one of the world's great and leading uh, creative marketing uh, organizations. Um, and, and most importantly, this marketing campaign, this announcement um, where, you know, the, there was the Tuvalu minister who was talking about this and then it zooms out to show that he's actually not on a real beach, but rather on a metaverse beach. Um, it shows a deep understanding of the metaverse, of what the opportunities and the possibilities of the metaverse and preservation on blockchain uh, really can look like. And they executed it well, at least in that first kind of announcement video. Of course, the devils are going to be the details. Let's see what they actually do with it. I hope it's not just marketing because... Um, Tuvalu clearly needs it. What is this not just marketing thing with you, right? So I think I need to have a word with you separately. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but here's the thing, right? I, I, I'll tell you where my mind boggles with this. If they, if they actually land up creating a sovereign nation in the metaverse, let's say the island vanishes, people immigrate to other places, UN accepts that they can have a sovereign nation in the metaverse, Maybe they create soul bound tokens so that they can connect the actual members of their community who are all over the world and saying that your digital twin will be in Tuvalu come what may. Um, and uh, 
and they enable it with visas and they enable it with all sorts of stuff and then there is an there is really an island nation called Tuvalu in the metaverse full all bells and whistles that is will not be just marketing to your point but it could be something that is that is real sbt oriented sovereign nation on the metaverse it's it's mind blowing yeah no, i love that third jp morgan registers a trademark for a crypto wallet gary I think this makes a lot of sense. I know, I know Jamie Dimon has been going off on cryptocurrencies. He kind of changes his mind, it seems, every other month on whether or not crypto is real or good. He's right now in the crypto is bad stage. Um, but for JP Morgan, it makes sense. Because, and, and I, by the way, I don't think we, I know we've been making fun of the trademark land grab uh, in the last couple of podcasts. I don't think this is just about trademarks. I actually believe that they are going to build their own custody solutions and they're going to build an, a huge suite of services around uh, virtual assets because they know the next generation is going to be holding virtual assets as potentially their primary wealth. And so for a bank like JP Morgan, if they don't get in on the game now, somebody else is going to. This, by the way, this is the place where, um, Digital only incumbents can actually replace traditional banks. This is still the place where, like fintech, up to this point, um, they have supplemented the, the 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 role of banks in our traditional financial ecosystem. But with the shift from you know fiat to well, actually, I shouldn't say fiat because crypto is not replacing fiat. But the shift into uh, digital assets and virtual assets having very 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 real value. Um, this is where upstarts can actually replace traditional banks. So having a big bank like J.P. Morgan come around and say, "Okay, you know whether or not we believe in the future of cryptocurrencies, if there is a potential that virtual assets are going to be held as real assets, then uh, we want to be able to build services for." It. I'm not saying that this is necessarily good for the crypto economy. That yet again another massive centralized bank might get in between the owners of these assets and what they can do with these assets but this makes sense for JP Morgan everyone gets excited about trademarks uh, if you're a big business if you're a big bank if you're a big organization you got to be doing trademarks all the time before you sort of even when you come up with a project name or a project plan or whatever right i would rather get excited about when they get patents when businesses get incorporated when projects get you know developed when they go and speak to investors that this is what they're doing uh, this is like someone buying an ens domain name right so it's i mean oh great you know gary's bought you know web3 and whiskey.eth so he's going to now set up a you know whiskey and web3 mega conglomerate and he's going to do airdrops and it's going to go into uh, wallets of all the, air all shots. the children they call all over air the world. shots <laughs> air shots i want to wait and watch right i think it could be a nothing burger it could be something but i hope they do some stuff they they are doing doing they're doing a lot of exciting stuff i can see especially with their sub brand uh, jp morgan onyx uh but it's but it's good to know but i don't know i, I want to wait and watch i i actually think they they they've done a sort of a 180 here right so ceo jamie diamond basically was the one that said bitcoin is worthless crypto has no intrinsic value but then since then they've done a bunch of stuff you know, in the space, they've opened up, uh, a, you know, a piece of land in the space in Decentraland. Uh, earlier in November, they were actually the first U.S. bank to issue tokenized deposits on DeFi and perform an international currency swap. Right? They basically traded Singapore dollars uh, with yen, um, and then now they're announcing this wallet. So I, I don't think it's you know just a trademark. Uh, I actually think they're taking a 180 here and basically saying, okay, if we can't basically you know, stop or shut down uh, crypto, let's do the complete opposite. Let's experiment, you know, across the board and actually see um, and almost front run the trade fi maybe industry and see how we can um, be the first to do these things. So um, interestingly, with this wallet that it's not actually just for holding crypto only and digital assets, but they've trademarked a bunch of other stuff, right? So crypto related services like virtual checking accounts, processing payments, etc. So I, I, I don't know. I kind of commend, you know, um, them for, for doing this. Um, I welcome more trade fi to enter and validate the industry. Uh, I think it just, you know, this type of innovation or competition, whatever you want to call it, just brings more and more, um, new products into the crypto world. So, okay. I got a fun one. A deep fake of SBF is offering refunds to FTX victims in a verified Twitter account scam. Suresh. Never before, um, has there been a need for, dyor been greater right um ai is writing blogs 
$8 verifications that drive share prices of listed companies down. Um, so Edelman Trust Barometer, which is probably one of the most trusted um, dipstick or sort of a sort of large scale survey, 380,000, uh, you know, respondents, 76 percent of them said, you know, around the world said that uh, I would worry about false information or fake news being used as a weapon. So I think fake news, deep fakes, all of this is a real problem. Um, I don't know how maybe maybe Elon Musk does something about it. Maybe regulators do something about it. This is here and now. It's quite scary. I think the internet always has, you know, someone that will take advantage of others, even after they're down. I mean, this is just uh, a little bit disappointing, a little bit sad. Um, but uh, I don't know. That's all I can say. I think what happened with FTX was already a bummer, and people are just kind of like rubbing it in. But this also tells you how much this FTX thing is in the zeitgeist, right? Because these deep fakes, they only matter when it's somebody that everyone knows. It's a situation that everyone understands. Um, so the fact is, uh, you know, a very, very, very thin silver lining to the FTX collapse is that the entire world um, is once again talking about crypto, not in a good way, but you know, maybe there is no such thing as you know bad PR. Suresh, you tell us if that's true. Um, but uh, but everyone's talking about it, so that's why it was worthwhile to do a defake of this. How many layers are here, by the way? SBF and the FTX collapse um, using a deep fake on a verified Twitter account by verified. I, I'm almost certain that this was a like a blue uh, blue check that was bought because of Elon. Yeah, yeah eight dollar. Yeah, and uh, and and the fact, of course, that Elon and uh, and SBF. You know, that connection, no one has tried to figure out. He's trying to separate himself from it. Right now, by the way, Elon, as of the last, like, 12 hours, is in a freaking Twitter a tweet war with uh, uh, the new news organization Semaphore um, because <laughs> Semaphore published a, a, an article about the relationship and the texts between SBF and, uh, and, and Elon about SBF owning part of, of Twitter. And then Elon went right back at Semaphore and showed the cap table of Semaphore without numbers, uh, because we know that SBF invested in Semaphore. We just don't know how much he owns. <laughs> so all of this is coming to bear. And it's just, I mean, you know, yeah, Twitter might not have that many employees anymore. It might still implode. But boy, I am hooked to Twitter right now because of everything that's going on. I know. It'll become the platform of choice. And uh, I mean, the fact that SBF did an interview using Twitter DMs and the conversations between CZ and SBF. Of course, Elon has set it on fire. Um, the big question is, when is Trump coming back to Twitter? That's, a, that's soon, maybe yeah. soon. <laughs> <laughs> this Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Final item. Shell, the oil giant, is making a move into the Bitcoin mining industry, offering lubricant and cooling solutions. Malcolm. Now, this, I thought, was pretty interesting. Uh, don't really hear this very often in the Web3 world. Here you have Shell, one of the largest energy companies. Uh, and as DDUP mentioned, they're effectively offering cooling solutions and lubricant solutions to Bitcoin mining. Um, their objective here is to actually cut carbon emissions um, through their process and then eventually lower the electricity costs, right? So Bitcoin mining becomes more scalable, uh, economically viable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I actually um, really thought this was a, a, a very interesting angle. So um, really interested in seeing where, where what happens here. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't know what to think about this. Um, this feels like a revenue opportunity for Shell, um, perpetuating the Bitcoin mining industry. Uh, making it more quote unquote efficient, but by how much, right? I think they're just trying to make money off of Bitcoin mining. Um, remember, the energy consumption of Bitcoin is absolutely massive. To, uh, to, to, to be able to mine a single block on Bitcoin now takes the equivalent of uh, the energy used over 50 days by an average American household to, to, to mine a single block. Um, and so this is it, it, it's it is a real energy suck. It is a I mean it's no longer a dirty secret. It is just the dirty truth 
of Bitcoin specifically. Uh, of course, Ethereum has now fixed that with um, the move to proof to stake, uh, proof of stake. Uh, the vast majority of other layer one protocols that we all use to build Web3 are extremely energy efficient, especially compared to that of Bitcoin. Um, so the one big remaining kind of elephant in the room when it comes to energy consumption is is Bitcoin. And I think Shell's just getting in on the game to make some money. Hey, what's that statistic? How many average American? 50, the, the, the energy used by 50, uh, 50 average American households. Sorry, the, the energy used... Um, over 50 days by an average American household is how much it takes to mine a single Bitcoin block. Wow. Does this include Thanksgiving days or no? Thanksgiving <laughs> goes way up, of course. So maybe maybe uh, maybe 40 Thanksgiving days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, listen, I think um, all big corporations are trying to think about Web3, which is a which is good thing for, for us, right? When we talk about talk to enterprise leaders, everyone's coming from a different angle. Um, I, I, I also read that Shell acquired a company called Applied Blockchain, and they're working with a few other oil majors to try and figure out if they can use blockchain for oil oil and commodity trading. Um, so it's interesting that they're taking different routes, uh, but clearly where there's energy requirements, I can see that an energy major wants to play. Uh, there is no question, but if they can, you know, learn and use and develop stuff that can that can be implemented into the way that they do ancillary businesses and trading and commodity management and stuff. Hey, that's great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your reactions to the news. This brings us to our main topic. We now get to talk a little bit about what happens if Binance were to collapse. Now, we just saw what happened when one of the top three um centralized exchanges and crypto collapses nearly overnight. I mean, over the course of a week. Uh, and, and we are just still trying to figure out how and why and all the ripple effects. And it turns out, you know, it, it just turned out to be a gigantic scam, just like we discussed in that last podcast. But what happens if Binance were to go down? Uh, we can assume multiple different things if Binance were to go down, that it was just like FTX, a giant scam, one that is at a completely even larger scale than FTX was, or Binance collapses because the entire crypto industry collapses, right? So there's a lot of ways that we can address this problem. We can think about it in different, from different angles. There are definitely uh, a multitude of implications if it were to happen. But before we get to the actual implications, let's make sure that we're on the same page, that all of our listeners know what Binance actually is. Um, Binance was founded in 2017, and it is the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange by a country mile, and I'll talk about that later. It's important to also note that it is a centralized crypto exchange, just like FTX is, like Coinbase, like OKX and OKCoin and all those guys. It's centralized. It was founded by a Chinese-Canadian entrepreneur. Uh, that we all refer to as CZ, and it is very, very large. Let me give a few stats about how incredibly large it actually is. Even in the uh, the depressed crypto environment of today, Binance is still averaging somewhere between 13 to 17 billion US dollars in trading volume every single day. The highest day of trading on Binance ever was earlier in 2022, when in a single 24-hour period, Binance saw 92 billion U.S. dollars in trading volume. Over the course of 2021, Binance reached 9.6 trillion U.S. dollars in total trading volume. That is nearly six times the amount of trading done on the next closest competitor in 2021, which I believe was Coinbase. Now, remember, I said that this was centralized, and a lot of people will ask, Okay, what about the decentralized world? Like, is there a lot more happening in the decentralized world? The answer is absolutely not. The decentralized world is like 10% of centralized exchange trading. And if we take a look at the world's largest decentralized exchange, which is Uniswap, today Uniswap is doing, on average, 24 hours, about a billion in trades. And that is compared to Binance's 13 to 17 billion. The best month of Uniswap's existence was like 86 billion trading volume in a month. That's still less than the best day that Binance has ever had. Okay, this is this is huge. We also have mentioned before, especially in the FTX podcast, uh, I should say specifically in the FTX podcast, that 
Binance's cash, which we, we don't know, we've never seen the balance sheet, but by all accounts, Binance's cash, um, their, tre- their, their war chest is enormous. Insiders have said that it is 10x uh, the amount of their compared to their closest competitor. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they have both BNB and BUSD. Two other tokens, one, which is their native token BNB that powers their blockchain, and the other is their uh, stablecoin called BUSD. BNB is the third largest token in the world based on market cap, and BUSD is the fifth. So Binance controls the number three and number five tokens in the world. And then finally, Binance has their own layer one protocol. It is now called the BNB chain. A big part of it is the Binance smart chain which I believe was launched in 2019. We'll get to that in a minute. I'll I'll throw it over to Malcolm to talk a little bit about their actual layer one protocol. So they have their own blockchain that people actually build on top of. Um, And it is an EVM compatible blockchain, which means that it can bridge to a lot of the other major blockchains as well. And what Binance has done, I think very, very, very intelligently, is that the token standards on Binance's own blockchain mirrors all of the major Ethereum token standards. So it's actually quite easy to be able to build projects on both and to be able to swap assets uh, and and see the future where Binance becomes one of the dominant um, uh, blockchains where just people swap assets back and forth. Gary, um, what was what's fascinating about the trading volume numbers in perspective is I think the Nasdaq does around one hundred and fifty billion dollars in trading volume daily. And at the at the peak of Binance at ninety two billion dollars. They were close, close yeah. right? And and you think, wow, th- we are talking about Nasdaq versus uh, Binance, and uh, and with fewer num, few m- way fewer number of users, way fewer number of um, tokens on it compared to stocks. And you go, holy smokes! I mean, there was a point when everyone thought that Binance would overtake Nasdaq before all of this crypto collapse. I mean, just just for. Uh, from a context perspective, about right? 30 million users, somewhere between 30 to 35 million users right now uh, on Binance. So what we're talking about here uh, when it comes to if Binance were to collapse, it, FTX was already bad enough. And I think a lot of it was the fact that, you know, SBF was this golden child, uh, was leading the, you know, the, the, the attempt to, 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 to create smart regulation, especially in the United States, um, was about effective altruism and many, many different groups of people kind of worshipped him. CZ is also worshipped in some ways, but not quite the same way as SBF was seen. Um, and, and so that was a lot of the FTX collapse impact. But if we're talking about the sheer size of the collapse is just another uh, order of magnitude. Um, so I want to throw it over to Malcolm first. Um, that's the size of it. But there, there, there's something even more important about Binance, with several things, including its technology. So Malcolm, tell us a little bit more about what you know about Binance and what a collapse of Binance could actually mean. Yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, Binance is the largest centralized exchange, but that's how they started. They actually have their hands in many different things. So they, they also do... Uh, decentralized finance. They have a DeFi product. They also invest in a bunch of different startups, right? And they're effectively like their tech and their products are effectively, um, you know, quote unquote, replicating, you know, a lot of the things that we see uh, that's out there already. So they're lining up their ducks to basically own the the, the entire market here. Um, but to give you a little bit of, of uh, context and to, to sort of describe it a little bit, because it is uh, a little bit... Uh, complicated. So as you mentioned, 2017 is when Binance started. That's when uh, BNB was was formed. They introduced their Binance chain uh, in 2019. And that was to actually facilitate DeFi, right? Because they saw, hey, potentially DeFi is a competitor to our CeFi, you know, product. We want to create something that also supports that. So they, they launched Binance chain. Now, Binance smart chain was then introduced in 2020. And this was actually to address the Binance chain's uh, difficulties and challenges for a couple things. One was the lack of compatibility to, to Ethereum and EVM. And the second was, was scalability reason. So they effectively created this Binance smart chain, BSC, to run parallel to uh, Binance chain in, in 2020. And w- effectively what it, what, what, it, what it did was it added the ability for people to use smart contracts and the compatibility to, to Ethereum. So 
uh, they're basically looking to uh, mimic, but also allow people, like you said, to transfer um, and migrate, if you will, from Ethereum and, 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 and you know, to, to BSC. I thought this was, of course, smart. Uh, Ethereum is still clearly the leader here, but from a technology perspective, everything's there on, on, on BSC. Now, just recently, earlier this year in February, they actually took Binance Chain and BSC and they merged it. So now actually the product today, it's called BNB Chain. So it's a little bit confusing, but so today we have this thing called BNB Chain. They renamed the previous, the first Binance Chain into Beacon Chain. And Beacon Chain today really is only used for governance, staking, voting. Uh, BSC is now called BNB Smart Chain, still BSC, but it's BNB Smart Chain. Um, and then they're working on a bunch of other things. They're working on side chains. They're working on ZK rollups, right? So lots and lots of tech coming out to continue to scale their tech, continue to optimize it, continue to make it awesome. Now, interestingly though, on the adoption side, I actually haven't seen too much happen here. In terms of dApps, I think it pales into comparison, uh, the number of dApps. I, I think Ethereum probably has close to 10x the number of dApps on Ethereum compared to, to Binance. There is one that um, uh, is, is, has a little bit of traction. Uh, uh, it's called PancakeSwap. And so PancakeSwap is a, is a, is a fork you know, off, of, off of Uniswap. It's, it's very similar to Uniswap and SushiSwap. Um, it's just another uh, DeFi um, swapping kind of protocol. So, um, that's the one that I know of. I don't know of any other, too many other, um, dApps that are actually on Binance. They do have, you know, they support NFTs. They, they, they have an, their own NFT marketplace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of the state of where Binance is, right? So I, I view them as this like giant that's effectively doing everything for the entire industry. And they're almost become this like shepherd of the industry, if you will. You know, I, I've talked to a number of people. Oh, by the way, l let me correct something I said earlier. Um, BNB is the number four uh, token yeah. and uh, and uh, BUSD is the number six. So four and six, not three and five. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Tether is yeah, like number Tether's three, Tether is number right? three, um, yeah. uh, largest by ca uh, market cap. So in speaking to people that are again, much smarter than us, um, or at least me, about Binance and asking the question, you know, can, buy, can, can what happened to FTX actually happen to Binance? The answer that I've gotten from a lot of insiders is no, because you should be able to trust Binance more, right? Binance has all these things. It is integrated into the ecosystem in a different way. Its business is much more real. Um, and it's you know, obviously its sheer size, it's just so much larger. But a lot of these people are the same that said that we could trust uh, FTX. So on a matter of trust, I mean, should we be able to trust Binance? I don't know if who wants to take that, like Suresh or, or, or Malcolm. Should we be able sure. to trust Binance? Look, you said the you said the T word, right? That's where it all eventually boils down to. Um, let's set a let's set a little bit of uh, context from the customer standpoint or consumer standpoint, right? So again, I, I just earlier in the podcast, I spoke about Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, financial services, which is where all of this is, is the second least trusted business group in Edelman Trust Barometer 2022. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll um, request D-Dubs to add uh, the link to Edelman Trust Barometer in the show notes. Um, it's, it's, you know, 56% of people trust financial services brands, right? And only 40% of the people trust crypto generally. Uh, compared to 62% who trust digital payments providers. Um, so here's the thing. I mean, there is trust is already down. Uh, probably it's, it's the worst it can be for crypto. But if Binance collapses, I think, uh, you know, crypto is going down, right? I think it, it's going to take a long time for, for people to come back, for confidence to come back, for capital to come back, for investors to come back. Uh, all of that. There are so many memes floating around, around, you know, your, what are you going to tell your grandfather at Thanksgiving dinner, you know, because he, 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 he invested in crypto, uh, since the last Thanksgiving dinner after, after what you told him, right? So if, if you were invited back, right? <laughs> that's it, right? Um, but, but here's the, here's the other stuff, right? I mean, Binance have been building their brand. Clearly, CZ is a huge part of the brand. 
he 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 came across as a bit edgy he came across as a bit challenging he's happy to his point of view was hey i need to break a few eggs to make an omelet so i'm going to go and break some rules right and that was sort of that's the image that he created I mean, fascinating that i mean he's worth uh, tens of billions of dollars no one knows really how much he's worth uh, but then binance went and signed up cristiano ronaldo right which i thought was really interesting because Cristiano Ronaldo's net worth is 115 million dollars in all. Right? So here you go. There is CZ, which is humongous net worth, and going and getting uh, Ronaldo to come and do this for him because it, there is clearly a bid to soften uh, Binance, Binance's image, CZ's image, uh, as well as trying to get um, you know the masses coming into uh, crypto and Binance itself. The other interesting thing about uh, them is. Uh, I remember reading a blog, the company official blog, where they said CZ is really customer focused. And that is why he's he is allocated 20 percent of his time in his diary to be on Twitter. Right. So so this entire Twitter mania, all of those conversations that he has, all of the things that he was firing away, um, he does that intentionally. Right. Uh, this is fascinating for me. In a, you know, if you had asked me uh, maybe three months or four months ago, uh, who do you think you will trust more? SBF or CZ, uh, I might have picked SBF, right? Because there is a sort of uh, saintly image. Uh, you know, he's the bridge to TradFi. Uh, he is flying the flag for, um, you know, the entire industry. He's going to meet regulators. Uh, he is talking to the CFTC about the DPCCA. Uh, he's doing all of the stuff. And he was going to be the guy who was going to help author the DPCCA, right? And I think then, then you go, holy smokes. Here you go, the guy who was supposed to be the sort of happy to break eggs to make an omelet guy versus the guy who was a saint. Um, you know, trust is, I think that's where it all boils down to. If Binance goes down, I think trust in the industry is 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 going it is going to go irrevocably down. Yeah, I mean, so so let's talk about that for a sec. How how can we get trust, right? Is it is it going to require, you know, recently he tweeted, you know, kind of a jab to uh, Brian Armstrong and, and Coinbase, right? Um and and Brian responded, "Hey, actually, we we're fine. Uh, we're a public company. All our financials are public. Here's a link." And NCC was like, "Okay, I you know he deleted his tweet." But so so does this mean like if Binance went public, then is that the thing that's going to build trust? Is, you know, if they opened up their yeah, books, I don't, I don't know that. I, mean, I don't think Binance will ever go public with the amount of cash that they've already stored away, supposedly. Um, I yeah I, I I think that this is what people are asking for. Everyone is asking for responsible accounting. Everyone is asking for balance sheets, right? Show us your audited uh, financials to let us know that we, as depositors and customers of these exchanges, and frankly, a lot of people use these exchanges as banks. They're literally just putting their life savings there and holding it there, which is what made the FTX thing collapse so bad for so many people. If we're going to put our money there, show us that you're not doing anything dodgy with our deposits, which it turned out FTX was doing everything they could possibly do that was dodgy with the deposits. And because this is not regulated, because there is no retail regulation in most major markets, and especially for FTX outside of the United States and Binance outside of the United States, none of it is regulated. None of it is therefore insured. And once it goes down, it goes down. You can't get it back. And this is the problem also with Binance, right? Um, CZ keeps saying, keeps coming out and saying, like everyone else, you can trust me. And in fact, he actually doesn't spend that much time even saying you can trust me. He just kind of lets his persona and lets the, his sheer size kind of tell that story for him. But don't forget how Binance first started, right? Is the fact that they start, they started off as a unregulated exchange that skirted all the rules, like Suresh said, right? They really played fast and loose. They did not have KYC and AML. They are still actually under investigation and have been accused of being a, a you know being part of enormous money laundering schemes of funding terrorist organizations, all that stuff. Um, they actually went against regulation in some markets and sold uh, coins to retail investors where they were when they were not allowed to. Uh, even their own launch of B and B back in the day. Um, they had to pay a fine to the SEC because the SEC found them guilty of having actually sold a security without ever registering it as a security. I mean, it was a drop in the pan for them, that fine, but they were fined. You know, uh, today, no one knows for sure whether or not CZ can ever go to the United States, whether or not the moment he lands at an American airport, he'll be picked up and arrested 
And it's very possible that he can't go to the United States. In fact, um, SBF made fun of that before FTX collapsed. He he was saying, <laughs> yeah, he tweeted that they were in, you know, that that, that there's certain people in DC um, you know, talking to regulators, and it's great that CZ is getting involved. And he asked, oh wait, can CZ even come to DC? Right. Um, so <laughs> there is a history there. And to Suresh's point, he was a little bit of the bad boy. I mean, as much as a bespeckled Asian man with a military hairstyle can be a bad boy, but he was kind of a bad boy because he kind of just did things uh, fast and uh, and and then and and, and built this huge empire. So as consumers, right after seeing what happened to FTX. You can't begrudge people who no longer trust any of this and absolutely do believe that at some point Binance could collapse. Yeah. Hey, and this is the thing, right? I think going back to Malcolm's question about how do we create this trust? I think we got to st- take a few steps back and saying, what is actually going on here, right? There is there is a lot of clash between morality. There's a lot of clash between ethics. There's a lot of clash because there is there is people's hard-earned money involved, all of that. So eventually, I think basic morality stems from the fact that you have the right to life, liberty, and property, right? Human beings are territorial, uh, and we, we want we want our sovereignty over time and space in some way. And the whole idea is what we want to own what we own. And this is where governments come into play. And you, in effect, we, we land up paying tax to the government to protect the property rights that we have, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. In, in many, many ways, um, governments are, uh, the network administrator of uh, the network called money exchange. And, and that's, that's the role that they have played. But, but you, here come, you know, here comes blockchain and Bitcoin and this whole conversation about the idea of freedom. Uh, comes into play saying, uh, look at this, the Fed are printing money. Therefore, we need to create this, you know, a parallel world where we are, we are free from the tyranny of the government. Uh, I think, I think it's sort of people who said that are so, sort of falling on their faces right now, right? Because every decentralization is good, not knowing um, you know, um, you know, who, uh, who's, who the players are is good. Uh, uh, anonymous wallets are all good. It's all good up until a point when someone owes you money or someone takes the money away from you, right? That's what has been fascinating because it, it just comes back to the whole idea of, Hey, um, in, you know, in, in me being able to integrate with the world, the, in me being able to deploy resources, I, I need my hard earned money. That money is mine and that the, those rights are mine and we need somebody to manage this. That's, that's where the, the, the trust will break down when that doesn't happen anymore. And CZ is trying to become that. Suresh, we, we made this point also in the previous, um, in the previous podcast. It's FTX is a centralized exchange. Um, Binance is a centralized exchange. I don't think uh, the champions of decentralization um, are falling on their faces. In fact, they're probably standing on top of the highest hill that they can climb to, screaming, this is why we need more decentralization. Right? We should not trust centralized organizations, however you know, well-spoken and you know, heroic their leaders seem, to manage and hold our assets. Um, so you know, I, I, I actually think that the, it, once again, this is to kind of change the conversation. I mean, to your point, we're agreeing that this changed the conversation about trust. Um, but I don't think that people are, you know, are are freaking out about decentralization. In fact, there are the people who actually understand are asking for more. Um, I, I do want to get to another implication because I think we've touched on the trust implication. We've touched on um, on, on what it would mean for, uh, you know, the ecosystem's reputation if this were to happen. What about the financial implications, right? We've talked about how big Binance is. Malcolm, what actually happens to uh, to the, I mean, maybe it leaks into the, the traditional finance world, but what actually happens on the financial side if Binance were to collapse? I mean, I think the entire industry, the entire crypto industry would be at risk. You know, this is the largest centralized exchange. Um, granted, you know, there was a couple other things that blew up right prior to this, but they're the largest. Uh, they're everywhere in the industry. It's massive. So it's not only a financial thing, but it's an impact um, and influence thing as well. And the trusting that we mentioned. So I think this would mean a near end um, to crypto, maybe temporarily, but definitely a near end. And everyone would certainly lose trust here. And so um, I feel like this would definitely cause a you know tsunami of 
other centralized exchanges. Uh, it doesn't even matter, right? It's like, hey, like centralized exchanges and crypto exchanges um, clearly, quote unquote, clearly don't work. And clearly it's just a scam, right? Because of everything that, you know, happened this year. And so I would actually think that people would start pulling out their money. They would no longer trust it. They go back to uh, perhaps trade five. I think regulation, if it's already not fast tracked because of FTX, would certainly be top of mind and certainly like figure out, okay, you know, how do we either completely stop this or how do we completely clamp it down? Um, but to your point, I think the DeFi movement, right? There'd definitely be like almost a DeFi revo revo um, revolution here. Um, but I don't think if that ever succeeds, I don't actually think it will be anytime soon. So uh, I think this, this financial impact would be massive, right? And it affects not only if I, you know, if I had money in Binance, of course, right? And if I had a bunch of things I was trading, of course, but then if you have a bunch of angel investments and a bunch of startups that would pretty much die too. If I was a founder in, in this space, I'm pretty much done too. So it's, it's like contagion in a way, I think. But here is the question, um, uh, Gary, this is a question for you, right? Around, yes, the, the, the hardcore decentralists, um, decentralization maximalists are probably saying, we told you so, this is why. Um, and so what happens to all the DXs? And what will happen to, what do you think would happen to all the decentralized exchanges if, if the centralized, ex, if the biggest centralized exchange goes down? I mean, it, it would, it would wipe out a lot of value. Um, and so it's not good for anyone. Um, but I would agree with Malcolm that I think that even right now, after FTX's crash, this gives the opportunity for decentralized exchanges to really rally and again, explain to the world why they exist, right? Um, why self-custody is so darn important. Because what happened with FTX, as far as we know, right? What happened to FTX is, is pretty much, impo I mean, not pretty much, it's impossible in a DEX. No one can decide to effectively siphon off the customer deposits in a DEX and then go do something egregious with them. Um, or nefarious with them. And, and, and that's the value of the DEX. The trading volume is not there. The, uh, the user experience is definitely not there. Um, it is extremely difficult, right, to onboard into a DEX, and it is even harder to, uh, to off-ramp from a DEX. Um, you can't buy things with credit cards. All of these things that stop DEXs from being adopted, even by crypto, like, like crypto-fluent people, not to mention uh, new entries into this world. Um, so I do think that DEXs today, and especially if Binance or anything were to happen, um, would gain market share for sure, right? Um, but it, it still wouldn't be good because it just it would, it would decrease the liquidity of everything. The more interesting question to me is, especially because this is a Web3 podcast, what happens to Web3? Um, now, in, in my opinion, over the course of the last few weeks, uh, what we've already seen in Web3 is that there has been a slowdown. And it might be momentary. It might just be a pause, right? Even though, you know, what crashed was part of the crypto ecosystem. But there's been, there's been, a, there's been a, a very you know, tangible slowdown in investments into Web3 companies. Um, I have talked to other Web3 founders that are concerned about the environment now um, and wonder, oh my goodness, this is still the right time to build and to b make big bets. Um, and you know a lot of uh, a lot of the infrastructure that is ne needed for the scaling of Web three and the adoption of Web three that could very well be at risk, especially because many of these companies, by the way, were funded by FTX Ventures, um, and we don't know if there's another round of funding coming. We don't even know if they still need capital calls that never came through. Um, I don't know if this is temporary. I hope it is because it is really important for people to understand that Web three is not the same as the crypto world. Now that said, it's inextricably connected, right? Um, the basis of Web3 is ownership. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's using blockchain to make sure that individuals can own their digital uh, identities, their data, their assets. Uh, but that requires, uh, you know, the value of ownership is that you can then therefore trade what you own, right? You can monetize what you own, you can exchange it for other things. And inevitably that still goes back to crypto, right? Um, and so not having a healthy crypto environment makes the value of Web3 or the future maximizing, maxim, 
ma- 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 what's the a verb? Maximization. The maximization of uh, of Web three it makes it less likely or more risky, right? Um, so I, I do think that this is going to have a long term impact. Um, it, hopefully, it is a dip and then it slowly grows back up. Um, and and I think the loss of trust in crypto because people don't have nuance and understanding is going to leak into not having trust of any decentralized technologies, including a decentralized internet. But I want to put it, uh, you know, to, to to you guys, Malcolm and Suresh. Um, if BNB, sorry, uh, if Binance were to collapse, is that the death knell in our generation of a decentralized internet? I don't think it's the death in our generation. I think it's a long pause. It's a long winter. Um, maybe a, akin to a lot of technologies that happened before that uh, were just way too early, like 10 years early, right? And I think part of it is, like you said, is trust. And so when there's no trust, there's not going to be any user adoption. And so what areas will have user adoption are probably the lowest level, right? It's literally down to the tech. So the tech might be able to find some use cases and it starts there. And then slowly and slowly it builds until it gets back up to the surface and say, oh, actually, all this infrastructure is already built out. And hey, the tech's working and we're actually using the tech for X, Y, Z. And so the next, you know, natural progression from there is, okay, back to what we were talking about in terms of what we, what we exist today. It's like, maybe, you know, using NFTs for X, Y, Z or um, using uh, C, Find, D, Fi for, for X, Y, Z. I think that's, that's what it's going to take. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, right? I think I think a couple of angles here. One is the tech will be the tech. So just like most internet users don't know what HTTP is or TCP IP is um, or SMTP is, but they use it every day. Uh, they don't know what encryption is, but they use payments every day. So I think they don't need to know the technology. The technology will sort of continue to build. I think there are lots of use cases, lots of um, you know, startups, lots of application layers coming through the infrastructure layers will get better and better. And I think, I think we will, we, the technologies will continue to build for use cases that are meaningful. The second one is maybe consumer side of things might slow down, but I think the huge enterprise, uh, use for, I mean, the, the conversation just, we just had about, you know, Shell, uh, trying to figure out if they can use blockchain for, uh, commodity markets. I think those kind of things, uh, could could get could will continue to be I mean people will in, continue to invest in those spaces and uh, eventually when the consumer side of things comes through I think it'll it is probably even now when the consumer side of things comes through people will probably not even know what the technology is they they wouldn't know that blockchain is involved they will just be net recipients of um, using the technology for bridging the trust gap using distributed ledger for uh, solving for problems payments. Uh, connections faster. I think those things will happen, which are which are inevitable. Okay, so Suresh, if one of your peers, another corporate executive, were to come to you right now and say, "Hey, man, um, you know, I've been a little bit spooked. We're assuming that this person doesn't know that much about decentralized technologies. I've been spooked by this FTX thing. I was thinking about experimenting in Web three, but uh, maybe not. What would you rec- You know, what what would you tell them? Like, what would you recommend to them? Um, would you tell them to take a pause or would you tell them to keep pressing on? I think it will depend on, depend on the context, right, Gary? I think the bigger question is, are we, uh, where are they, where are they, where were they hoping to use Web3 technologies? Uh, I wouldn't push them into it, but if they are not going to use the Web3 technologies now, eventually they will have to because blockchain is inevitable. I think utilization of blockchain is inevitable. You can already see there are so many use cases uh, in enterprise uh, where it can play a role. Uh, they will eventually land up at a place where they might land up using blockchain without knowing that they are leaning into Web3 technologies. That's what's going to happen. And Malcolm, uh, what about you if an entrepreneur were to come to you and say, I thought I was going to build something in Web3, uh, but this has spooked me. Um, what should I do? I think they should focus uh, on problem solving, right? So don't make the big bets just yet. Focus really on what's real today. I think it's very easy for a lot of startups to dream big, which is fine. A lot of founders to dream big and have this vision. And, you know, they sometimes write it off as saying, okay, this is going to take 10 years to build. But I think no matter what, you're going to have to find some traction towards that 10 years. Um, and in an industry that has taken a long pause and a long winter, right? And by winter, I don't mean three years. I mean, maybe 10 years. And so I would just focus on, okay, is this problem, you know, is this solution solving a problem? Yes or no? That's it. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for this lively conversation. Uh, I certainly hope that this what-if scenario, of all the ones that we've addressed, I hope that this what-if scenario does not come to pass. Binance is huge. Um, it is multiples of FTX, and we've already seen the ramifications of an FTX collapse. Um, it's really actually hard to imagine how deep the hole would be if Binance were to go down. Now, the central challenge, of course, to all of this is that if there is another shock to the crypto system, it could significantly delay the mainstream coming into decentralized technologies um, and the scaling of Web3, which I think all of us would agree uh, would be sad. There is a trust problem, right, in all of this too. Suresh pointed out that only 60% of people actually trust traditional finance, which is already really quite low. And at this point, only 40 people trust crypto. Um, and that's devastating. That's like lower than, uh, you know, Trump ratings um, at times. And so we, we really have a trust problem already in the industry. These events are not helping. As Malcolm said, uh, the collapse of Binance would plunge the crypto world into a very, very long winter. I don't think anyone doubts that, by the way, just because of its sheer size. Now, it might start a move, a, a, you know, a faster move into decentralized finance. Uh, and the reality is that this moment in time is a really interesting test for how decentralized do we believe uh, the future of the Internet and the future of virtual assets ought to be. So... Even though with the collapse of FTX and hopefully not, but, you know, with the co topic of today, the potential collapse of Binance, even though those are all terrible, terrible things and there are lots of losses in our community, um, we should remember that there is a relatively new adage in our world, not your keys, not your coins. There's a lot of infrastructure to be built. There's a lot more to experiment on and, um, and establish in Web3 that we still think is good for the world. So this has been Web3 and Whiskey. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite audio platform. And if you don't mind my shiny face and odd lighting, go smash the like and subscribe button on YouTube. Please also subscribe to the weekly departures newsletter that will further explore Web3 innovations and provide explainers for the enterprise world. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Happy Thanksgiving. Drink up your whiskey. We'll see you guys next time.